Hello and welcome to the Morales channel. This is the Kronos Web3 Magic Treasure Chest. The Web3 Magic Treasure Chest game uses Morales and Kronos. Morales provides a single workflow for creating high performance dApps. And Kronos is the first EVM compatible chain built on Cosmos. Let's dive in and take a closer look at this sample game. In this game, users spend in-game currency to win gold and NFT prizes. We'll learn how to program in Unity and on the blockchain to add this functionality. Hi, my name's Sam. I'm a Unity certified developer at Morales. I have over 20 years of game dev experience and more than 10 years experience as a digital nomad. I love spending time in nature and practicing sports, as well as drawing, painting, and making music. To learn more about Kronos, click the link above. You'll find out what is Kronos, what are the benefits of using it, and what makes it a great fit for your projects. And to learn more about the Morales Web3 Unity SDK, click the link above. That topic covers the benefits of Morales, how to integrate it into your Unity project, and best practices for getting started. For the sample game, Kronos will be used for authentication and will fund the account. To learn more about how to set that up, click the link above. Morales includes complete learning resources. The learning resources include sample games, like this one that we're looking at today. Each sample game represents a complete, simple game using the technology we want to showcase. To get started and follow along, download the project from the GitHub. In the Web3 Magic Treasure Chest, you pay to open the treasure chest. And users can open the treasure chest to win rewards, including NFTs and currency. The sample game includes six different scenes. The developer console is not meant for a user's eyes. We won't focus on that today, but it's a helpful scene to dig into the back end and how it connects with the blockchain. We'll focus on the game scene today. Once you open the game in Unity, to get started, open the README, follow the steps covered in the README, and enjoy the game. Some advice on how to use these sample projects. You can open up each scene and play them like a user, learn the functionality from a user perspective, then open up the code and dig in, learn how it's created, and see which portions of that you want to experiment with within the game project, and eventually port them over into your project. Now, not all SDK functionality requires authentication, but for simplicity's sake, this game requires authentication before doing anything. So when you go into the main scene, it will invite you to authenticate, and you handle that, then the rest of the game stays logged in. Many of the major Unity features are covered in this game including animation, 3D rendering, the universal render pipeline, and using the mouse for input. What are the things that every dApp needs? Authenticate users, send assets, fetch assets, communicate with contracts, and watch for real-time events. This game does four of those five, so there's a lot to learn here just by taking a look at how the game operates. The main assets here are a prize, and the gold currency used in the game. Both of those borrow from existing contracts. Developing Web3 games requires a Web3 account that you'll log in with. This game is best matched with two different ones, one to deploy your contracts, and then another one to play the game with. For more information about setting that up, check out the Kronos Authentication and Faucet video that I talked about earlier. Next, let's take a look at the project status. During this talk, we'll take the complete game, but right before the Web3 has been integrated. Together, we'll add Kronos to the game. So at this point, what has already been completed is the planning, design, the core development of the Unity project, and together, we will add the Kronos testnet. We'll plan what we want and define our needs. We'll set up the contracts in Hardhat, and then we'll integrate those contracts into Unity. As a developer familiar with Solidity and the EVM blockchains, I could choose any compatible chain. So why use Kronos? Kronos is EVM compatible. It's scalable. It's interoperable with other chains. It uses proof of authority, and it's a project that's open source. 
let's talk about scalability. From an ease of portability standpoint, as I mentioned, with the already familiar concepts of EVM and Solidity, this is a welcome home to do your development. From a funding standpoint, to encourage development in this ecosystem, there are grants available. And the user base is growing. With exciting momentum, Kronos is getting more and more users involved every day. Now let's take a look at the smart contract setup. The process here is to use Hardhat, set up and deploy the contracts. Then after this step, we'll move into Unity and call those contracts. So what are the different ways we can call contracts? Well, first there's deploying the contract itself. And then from Unity, we can run contract function for read-only calls, and we can execute contract function, which will read and write state on the blockchain. The blockchain itself can also emit events back into Unity. We won't be using that in this project. Here's a high-level overview I used when I was planning out the contract sequence. This helped me define how many contract method calls I would need, and eventually which ones would be getters and which ones would be setters. Getter functions can be used with the run contract function, and setters that actually change blockchain state require the execute contract function that we discussed. Two of the contracts used here are a custom gold contract and a custom prize contract. When thinking about the fungibility that I needed, as well as the ability to store metadata, I chose base contracts to extend. You can think of ERC-20 as a contract that defines some sort of currency that users have zero of or infinite. And you can think of the ERC-721 as an NFT. This is more of a unique item that is owned by exactly one owner at a time. That's a good fit for our collectible prizes in the game. Here's a snapshot of the UI of the game with the gold and the prizes shown how many have been collected. Here's an illustration of how all the contracts on the Solidity side interact. I chose to have the game contract be a custom contract that wraps all other calls. Here, the game contract calls the gold contract and the prize contract to relate to those two systems. This simplifies Unity in that it only needs to know about the game contract. So with those three contracts in place, I'm able to edit those contracts on the Solidity side, clean, compile, and test them during development. When I'm happy with it, I deploy those contracts, and at that point, they're available for Unity to call. I'll copy and paste some values from the Solidity side into Unity, including the address so Unity knows where in the blockchain to look for the deployed contract. A note about deployment is because I've chosen to have the game contract be a wrapper for the others, is that in the constructor, when I create the game contract, I pass in the reference to the address of the other contracts. Anytime one contract has the address of another, it's able to call any public methods. So this is how it wraps the functionality of the gold and the prize. A more straightforward way to organize this would be to have all of the functionality within one contract. And for certain games, that might be the way you wanna go. Here, I'm trying to show the beginnings of how you would organize a much more complex project than this sample game. You would wanna start thinking about contracts calling contracts as a better way to organize and secure the solidity side of your gameplay. Now let's look at the Unity setup. So after we've got the hard hat set up, deployed, and we've captured those values, including the address to paste into Unity, we can move on and do the Unity development. This game uses a very light version of the MVCS framework. This is a custom framework, just an organization of classes that I created on the c -sharp side inside Unity. And it's a pretty common pattern for games of medium to large complexity. The view handles rendering out to the screen and taking user input. The model stores every piece of data that is come in from the service layer and also on the client side. You can think of the controller as the glue that brings it all together. Most of our code sits in the controller. And then there's the service layer. Now, service is optional for a game that has no backend functionality and no communication with things outside of the game. Of course, here we're building a Web3 game, so we're going to be speaking to external services like our blockchain. So I've done something special here, which is taken the service layer and divided it into two. I have somewhat of an offline mode and an online mode. So the way that works is the controller asks a factory. The factory is a simple class that returns one of two service types. 
If we're in the offline mode, it'll use local disk storage service. At the point of this video where we begin coding, we're using only that. We have the complete game, but it's only reading and write to local disk. It's a very simple form of the game that requires no online connection and no blockchain. We'll together add the game contract service. This is an alternative. The game either uses the local disk storage or it uses the game contract service. When we enable and complete the code inside the game contract service, it's using the full power of the blockchain. We'll code that together. So where is that type set? Well, there's the game configuration, which you can find in the project window. You can also find this from the readme and navigate that way. Once you open it, you would choose which one of the types you want, either the contract mode or the local disk storage, and you press play in Unity and the game exclusively uses that one mode. This is nice during development because the local disk storage is a bit faster to create and requires no online connectivity. Each call is much quicker as well because it's all happening local. You can complete, in theory, the entire game that way. Then, once the game is ready to go, you can then integrate into the Web3 version. And once we integrate that Web3 version, there's two different ways we're going to call the backend. We can either call those deployed Solidity contract with run contract function. We'll do that for all getters, where we just retrieve an already set value from the blockchain. This is helpful to know, are we currently registered? How much gold do we have? And how many of those prizes have we got? This just asks the blockchain for existing state. It's not changing any state. And from within Morales, that's easy to call. The second way to call contracts is with execute contract function. This is useful for all setter operations, ones where we want to actually change state on the blockchain. So anytime you'd want to set how much gold the user has, you'd want to register or unregister the user to the game. These are some concepts we'll see in the code. You're going to want to do it with this one. This is actually able to change state on the blockchain. And with Morales, here's how you call execute contract function. So in summary here, when planning, I looked at the sequence, how the game is going to flow, which contracts it's going to need to call, and a primary consideration is which of the methods are setters, and which ones are getters. So the top here is the getters. We're going to want to be getting the registration and the gold info and prize info. And then for gameplay, rewards, and debugging, I've got a series of setter methods. Again, the distinction here is that all the getters will need to be called with run contract function and all the setters be called with execute contract function. Other than that, the setup is pretty similar. And then from a gameplay UX strategic standpoint, it's of note that every getter call here does not interrupt the user's flow. They don't need to open their Web3 wallet and sign the transaction. But you'll see with each of the execute calls, the user is interrupted, so to speak. A prompt shows in the game that says, you need to look at your Web3 wallet and sign this transaction. So you wanna think about gameplay where you want to interrupt the user's flow. Ideally, you sign as few contracts as you can, or you combine functionality into one method. That's actually what I did here in the start game and give rewards method. I did a couple different things all packed into one method on the Solidity side, just to save me from having two calls to the user. So now when the user starts the game, they do sign the transaction, but that's all they need to do, just once. Next, let's do some live coding. Here we are in the Morales GitHub. So that you can see me better while I'm doing the live coding section, I'm gonna lower the opacity. So from the readme here, we can see details about how to set up the project, the configuration and structure, different screenshots about the project and the gameplay, as well as information about Morales. We can download the project here to get started. Once the project is downloaded, this is the structure. There's a Unity folder containing everything that Unity needs to open. It's this exact folder you'd open in Unity. And then we have a smart contracts folder. Here's where we're gonna work within to do the hard hat testing and deployment of the contracts. We open up that folder in your favorite code editor. For me, I'm using Visual Studio Code that's freely available. Let's take a look at the structure. The classes folder has any individual classes that are used. I have one here for the reward that is passed back from Solidity when the user wins something. The contracts folder holds all the individual contracts in Solidity. This is where the bulk of the work is going to be. 
in particular, the game contract. Libraries are optional, but I chose to organize both classes and libraries in this project. You can take a look at that custom library, which handles some things including the randomization that I used for when the user randomly wins gold or randomly wins a prize. The scripts folder are run for deployment. We'll do that at the end. The tests here are run against each individual public method for all of the contracts. Tests are optional, but recommended in Solidity development. Imagine if I opened Unity and reintegrated for every single change. That's quite time consuming and you're never quite sure if the bug is on the Unity side or the Solidity side. These tests run rapidly and right on the Solidity contract itself without opening Unity. So this is a great way to develop. The hard hat config is set up to know how to deploy the project and the instructions text shows everything you need for a very first install and deploy and set up and get that set up before you move on and follow along. I'll take a brief look at it here to give you the highlights. This goes step by step and works on your computer so that you can install Node.js and all the dependencies that are needed to get Hardhat set up and running. Some of these steps are one time only. It's okay if you do them again, for example, if you've already deployed Hardhat projects before, some of these will be redundant, you won't necessarily need to install them, but it's harmless to go ahead and follow every single step here. Just make sure you have the latest of everything you need. And once things are set up, we'll be doing some command lines. In particular, we're going to be doing the test and then finally the deploy. And finally, after the deployment, we'll copy some of the output values, bring them into Unity and continue our development there. Once you complete the instructions, you would be able to deploy immediately. However, so that we can follow along together, I'm going to rename a file here. The video start file is an incomplete one. It's currently commented out, so to speak, but I'll do the renaming so it becomes active and I'll show the failing tests. Then we'll do some coding together and we'll see the passing tests. At that point, we'll be ready to deploy. I'll rename the original to include .bak for a backup. That will essentially comment it out. And then I'll rename the video start to the original file name without the .video start. That essentially comments it in, and now it's used. Let's run the tests and see that they fail because that file is properly incomplete at this point. You can run command lines any way you want. If you're inside Visual Studio, you can run the terminal. As the instructions text shows, there's lots of commands here that you will run along the way to setting it up, and then also each time you iterate on your project to test it and also to deploy it. Let's just start with the test method. This is gonna run all the tests inside of our test folder, and we'll see that some of them fail. Now the details of how tests are set up and which tests actually fail are outside the scope of this video. You can look at those tests and see how they operate. The important point here is that we'll see them fail. It will provide full details on why. We'll just go ahead and code in the original source, and then we'll see them pass. If you were to add more functionality after the end of this video, for example, custom functionality, you'd want to add a test, see that your method fails, complete the implementation of your code, and then see that the test passes. This is test-driven development and is a hallmark of using these tests as part of your development process so that you build more robust code. Here I'm running the test, and here's the output. In short, every red error here is a problem that we'll fix when we add the final code. Scrolling up through the results, we can see lots of red, indicating there's lots of failed tests. That's okay. Now let's look at our test contract. We'll do a brief overview, including seeing many empty methods. We'll implement just a couple of them, and then we'll finish out and run the tests again to see that they pass. First, we set our Solidity version. We import the custom and third-party code. We set up our custom main contract here, the game contract. This is a proxy for all the other contracts. Our game just calls this one, and this one calls the related gold or prize contract as needed. The fields here are already complete. I didn't remove any for the video start, so let's take a look. We're gonna store the address for each the gold contract and the prize contract, and we'll do a mapping from address to bool. Every time you see mapping in Solidity, you can think of that as a database that's going to hold some user-specific information. So if I was playing this game, my mapping would store at my address a bool if I am registered or not. And simultaneously, if this game is living and live and you were to call that game, 
it would say is your address registered or not and have a separate bool value. You could think of these as a array or a dictionary or a mini database is the way that I think about it. The important point here is when you see a mapping by address, that's going to be some user specific info and that's what we need. Let's implement just a couple of the functions here. First of all, because this is a wrapper, each time this is constructed, we need to pass in the already deployed contracts that we're wrapping. So here we're going to store those two addresses, and then I also use console log here and there to output some data. As we would run those tests, within all the test results that we saw there with our failing tests, we would see the console log output. That's optional, but quite useful, especially during debugging. So if you wanna know what the current value is inside any of these methods during the testing, you can do that. Now the game is gonna call two different types of methods. Remember, we're gonna have getters that do not change any state. They just get the value. That's why we call them getters. And then setters that also might change the state. So here's all the getters. Now from Unity, we're gonna call these with run contract function, and we'll get back a strongly typed result. In our case here with the first one, it's going to return a bool to Unity. So remember we talked about the mappings and how that address can give us some user-specific data. So let's see how we would populate each of these. So first, each time the game calls to check, are we currently registered? We can return that value from the mapping. The registration concept is game specific here. What I was trying to figure out from the game perspective is, has this user ever played the game before and are they currently registered? Now, why is this important from a gameplay standpoint? Because the game consumes gold. Users are given some gold when they first register, but they're not given gold again as part of the core gameplay. Then each time they open a chest, they spend some of that gold. So there's lots of different ways this could be organized, but I just chose to say, if you've never been registered before, you're allowed to register. And at that one point, you're given some gold. Then inside the get gold here, notice how there's some way that I call the get gold contract. Then in the get gold method here, notice the specific way this language is set up. I'm using the gold contract address, wrapping that as a gold type, and then being able to call any public method on it here. You'll see this pattern used throughout the class. It's a simple way to have Unity call only the game contract, and the game contract in turn asks specific other contract for some data. And in get reward history, after the user has been rewarded, the game can call and ask, well, what was the reward? You'll notice a helper function here that just does some conversion, but this would show you just won a prize or you just won some gold and here's the details. So that's the end of the getter implementation. Now together, we're not gonna implement every one of them, but you're invited to start with the video start file and complete all the methods yourself. It's a good exercise. We've completed all the getters. Now let's do a few setters together and then I'll paste in the rest and we'll go ahead with a successful testing. So remember a core concept here in the game is to register. Also because debugging your own game is very helpful, in the game I have an unregister button. Probably in a production environment you wouldn't have that because unregistering is a bit too powerful. It gives the opportunity to the user for them to get more gold. But here it's very useful from Unity to be able to register and unregister. So let's see how I handle each of those. So first in register, I'm gonna take advantage of one of those mappings. We have a mapping that tells, is my specific user registered or not? That's going to be a different stored value for me than it would be for you or any other player. Notice the msg.sender, that's a special value. I didn't declare it and we don't notice it in the method here, but every method call that you call, that does state changes like this, gets the address of who called it. Now this is going to be our Unity user and their Web3 address. So when that comes in, I can securely know that I can map any data to that user. So the msg.sender would be my address when I call and the msg.sender would be your address when you call. By storing it this way, I'm able to have my registration not impact your registration. So contracts can store shared data you could get some value that I set and get. But this is game is not organized that way. This game is organized that you would only get your data and I would only get my data, which for the needs of this game is exactly what we want. The second thing that I do there is I set the gold. You can see that I'm setting gold based on a constant value that's stored in the library, but I'm giving every user 100 gold, I think, to start out. Then let's take a look at the unregister. Well, first off, I want to set the gold back to zero. So if the user had previously played, they had 
100 gold that they were given, more or less, whatever it is, I set it back to zero. So this nulls out their bank account, so to speak. Then I simply unregister them. I do the same thing that we saw in register, but set the value to false. Let's take a look at one more method, the most complex method, the start game and give rewards. This is called as the user opens the chest. And while the user feels like they have to wait about 10 seconds and see the animation of the chest open and the reward shown on screen, they're actually instantly rewarded at that point. This makes for a simpler game. So at the point of start game and give rewards, we do all of that together. Let's take a look at how we would solve that. So in our game, when the users play, they're able to decide how much of their gold they want to bet. They can do one or 30 or 150, I forget the actual values, but the idea is that the more that they give, the higher the potential prize is. Of course, they could bet 150 gold and win much less substantial rewards, so there is risk there. This is a simple gameplay mechanic, but it also demonstrates us sending a value from Unity up into the solidity here. That comes in as the gold amount. So the first thing I do is I deduct that gold from the user. Here they're actually charged for playing the game. Now that's optional, you don't have to do your game that way, but I think it's a nice amount of tension here that the user has some risk that they're putting in each time they play. Next I use the game library to roll a random value from zero to 100. And then I say if the value is less than 50, reward you one way, giving you gold equal to that. Or if it's over 50, then I reward you with a prize. Now, the prize is actually a minted NFT, but for the simplicity of this game, it's not an image that's uploaded per se. It's just simply a unique NFT that has metadata representing the title and the price and the type of that reward. So then the user sees them in game as collectible items. Finally, I store in a mapping the last reward for me as the person playing this game. Again, my last reward would have a different value than yours because we are both able to play games concurrently that don't affect each other, which is what we want. And finally, if the prize is a treasure NFT, I do the minting for that NFT at this moment as well. So by the end of this method, the user has paid gold, potentially been rewarded with gold or with a prize. Now, for my gameplay, I've decided that the user always wins something, but I certainly could have had some random result value there that rewards nothing. But for simplicity and to have some direct result and feedback every time you play, you always win something. Now, it's possible that you win five gold even though you bet 150. So the user can still have a negative result, giving you some tension and excitement in the gameplay. Now, for sake of time, I've pasted in the rest of the succeeding values. So let's open up the terminal and run those tests again and see that they pass. Now there at the bottom in green, we see that all 29 have passed. So we're ready to move forward. Now what we wanna do before every deployment is we want to clean, compile, check the coverage, and then test. I've got a custom task here that's already set up in your code that you can call. It's CCCT and it runs like this. So because that operation ends with testing, we see a similar result that we saw before, 29 of the tests have passed. If we scroll up, we'll see quite a bit of other stuff, including a table that represents code coverage. Now, as the instructions tests explain, doing code coverage is not required, but it's nice. It shows you a table of all your methods and making sure that you have some tests that cover them. Again, you don't need tests and you don't need the test coverage, but the more you embrace those concepts, I think the more robust and error-free your code will be. We also see a nice table here of all the cost of calling each of these methods. Because we're programming on the blockchain, deploying has a cost and calling each of the setter methods also has a cost. You can see a table here and there's a deep dive you can do online to learning how to optimize these. I've done no effort to make these optimized, so of course these could cost less. Now, because we're using the testnet, we don't actually accrue any real world cost. We can use the faucet, as that earlier video explained, to give us free funding. But this is something you wanna be aware of as you think about moving your test projects into the real world and knowing that each of them has a cost and that you can reduce the cost. So each time we run that custom command, the CCCT, we can then deploy the contract. Let's do that now. The instructions text includes this line for deployment. I'm showing it here and I've updated the screen layout just so it shows clearly on one line. 
We're calling npx hardhat run, the name of the script for deployment, and then our network, which is Kronos testnet. Let's run that now. That deployed with success. It took about two minutes, but I skipped the video ahead. Let's take a look at the results and see what we need from this. There's really one key piece of output here. That is when the deployment completes, I have custom output that I've created that we can copy and paste directly into Unity. From a high level standard flow, you would need the ABI, which is this big blob of text, and then the address. I have a little bit of a different way to format it, so I've updated the output. You can look at the deploy script to see exactly how that's done. So I will copy and paste that into Unity for the next section. But before we go, I wanna show one more thing. This is set up to do also verification. Down here, we see that their verification is happening. So what this means is each time you deploy, which you could deploy without verification, but the nice thing is here, we're sure that that got deployed properly and is sitting up on the blockchain. You can follow the link here and see the results. Chronos Scan is the blockchain explorer for Chronos and the Chronos testnet. Because we've deployed on the testnet, we can see that we're successful and we could examine lots of different details here if we wanted to. We don't actually need anything here to move forward, but it's a fun place to explore and see all the different ways that you can inspect this contract. One of the things I think is especially cool is under the contract tab, you can read the contract and write the contract using all the public methods that you've just deployed. This is another great place to debug and something I'd love to cover in a future video topic. Next, let's move on to Unity. All right, here we are inside Unity. We'll start by opening the README asset. Here in the README asset, we can see some information about Morales and the project from a high level. And we see complete instructions for getting started. At this point of the video, we've already done step number one to set up the back end. We've set up the values from number one and pasted them into Unity. Let's go ahead and click Add Example Scenes to Build Settings. Since this is a multi scene project, it's important you click that at least once before you get started. That loads all the example scenes into the game so that once you're at runtime, you're able to load between them. That's a classic Unity requirement, and we've done that for you here. Then you can either arrange these windows however you like, showing the different inspectors and consoles how you like, or you can load the default one for this game. That just resets and gives you the same layout that I'm showing. Then we can set up some values inside the game configuration. Let me click on that. Here you can turn on or off the logging for the game. I'll have it off so that we see less console traffic here. Uh, you can also change the different service type. So if we run it in local disk storage, this is an offline only mode that uses no Web3. If we run in contract mode, that makes contact with the backend and our deployed script on the blockchain. Let's go ahead and run in local disk storage mode. Now, let's authenticate. And let's sign in. Now we're authenticated in the game. Let's view our collection. Because we haven't played yet, we don't have anything in our collection. Let's look at the settings. Here we're able to reset the data if we had some progress throughout the game. We can log out, of course, but let's go ahead and play the game. In the top UI, you can see we haven't earned any prizes yet, but we have 100 gold. So to open up a chest, we can bet 10 gold, 30 gold, or if we had 150, we could bet that. That teases the user that there's something to do if they earn up to 150, that button would become enabled and they could give it a try. Let's play for 30 gold. Now 
The chest opens and I'm rewarded. Let's play again. I'll play for 30 gold. This chest opens and this time I've won a prize. If I view the collection, we can see that that one prize was the type amazing prize and it's worth 50 gold. In a future version of this game, you can imagine giving the users the ability to sell their prizes or perhaps transfer them to other users. That's not enabled in this game, but let's say it was. I could select the prize, choose to sell it, and earn some or all of the original 50 gold, depending how the game is organized. Now let's reset our data. You can see that we're back to 100 gold and zero prizes. That's it, that's the complete game. Moving on here in step six, we can click through and get to those instructions that we discussed when we talked about testing and deploying the contracts. We've already done that. And then finally, once you're all ready, you can open up any one of the scenes and get started. If I open up the intro scene and press play, we'll play the game. Let's take a look at the scripts involved. In the scripts folder, you can see that we have a very light MVCS framework set up. There's controller, model, service, and view folders with related classes. The core classes that you can start looking at are at the, at the root here. The game singleton is the main entry point to the game code. Some common shared functions are in the game helper, and some tweakable constant values are in the constants file. Here in this video, because we're going to talk about the service and connecting to the contract, let's take a look at those classes. The service factory takes a look at the type that we set on the game configuration asset. If we've set it to contract, it will load the contract service. If we've set it to local disk storage, it loads the local disk storage service. The game contract service class is complete and you could launch the game like that. However, to have a video starting point here, I'm going to delete that class and rename the dot video start so that it becomes enabled. Now that that's enabled, I'll open up and uncomment the code. So I'll remove the comments here. Now that we've uncommented the code, the game contract service is ready for use. Let's take a look at some of the key methods. We can see here in the constructor that it makes an instance of the game contract. Let's take a look at that. The game contract is a custom client side mirror of what we have in the game contract on the solidity side. 
Every call that we do in the contract service goes through the game contract here on the client side. The main detail to see here is set contract details. This is the method into which we paste the values we get from our deployment. Remember here in Visual Studio Code, after a successful deployment, we got this chunk here. Let's copy that complete chunk and paste it into Unity. I'll simply paste it directly over the existing method. It looks similar, but the values inside the quotes have changed. This has the latest deployed treasure prize contract address, the address itself for the game contract, and the ABI for the game contract. Let's do a brief overview of the game contract class, and then we'll spend most of our time looking at the contract service. Remember in Solidity, we set up get is registered. The piece of this code that maps directly to that is in quotes here, get is registered. That name needs to match one-to-one -one with the Solidity naming, including case sensitivity. Now that we're using run contract function on that, passing in that name, we can also pass in any optional parameters that we'd need. In this case, and all of our getters, we're going to pass in the address of the user. We get the address by using get Morales user async, building a dictionary, and passing in the ETH address from the user. Because we're working on an ETH EVM blockchain, we're going to use the ETH address. Notice too that we get back a string result from run contract function, and then we type it as bool. That's because on the Solidity side, I know I'm returning a bool, so I know to manually do that conversion here. Let's look at the contract service to see how this gets called. So here in the game contract service, remember that we renamed the video start file to use. So that means that these methods are properly incomplete at this stage. So let's take a look at an example of how we call one run contract function and we'll use get is registered async as an example. We see our video to do here is to return the real values. So we've seen inside the contract class that there's a method ready for us. So for the game contract service to call its get is registered, we just ask the game contract to contact over the blockchain and get the value from there. In this specific case, it seems a bit redundant that we have a class that calls another class, but that's a pattern we've also used on the Solidity side. Remember how the game contract Solidity file wraps some functionality of the other contracts. This is a common pattern just to separate coding concerns. So for the rest of the getter methods, we would do it the same way. I'll skip ahead of that. Now let's take a look at one of the things that's not a getter, but a setter. The crucial function that we have here, start game and give rewards. Let's see how we'd set that up. Here we'll ask the game contract to call its method that will communicate to the blockchain, pass us back a string result value. Now, something to note here is that every time we're calling execute contract function, we don't get back a predictable result value like a bool or something interesting like the amount of gold we have. Instead, it's always the transaction hash. If we click through to the game contract, we can see here that we're not running run contract function, which returns strongly typed info. We're getting the execute contract functions return, which is always a string and always represents the transaction hash. From a Unity game perspective, the transaction hash is not too useful. So the pattern we define here is we set using execute contract function, and we always go back and call one of our getter methods that's able to get that strongly typed info. The equivalent here 
is after we've done the reward with start game and give rewards, we have an equivalent of get reward history, and that is called with run contract function. And you'll see in this game, we have that pattern quite a bit where there's an execute contract function that sets something like the gold value. And then there's a run contract function that gets the value back, like get gold. So back here in the game contract, you can see we're getting that hash back. And then if you find it's useful, especially during early debugging, you can log out that result value just to make sure that it came back. It's gonna look like O, X, and then a long series of numbers. So it's not terribly useful, but if you see it coming back, you're sure that it was executed properly. Now that we've taken a look at just a couple of the methods and how to implement them, I went in and pasted the rest of it. If you'd like to start with that video start file and manually implement each of the methods, go for it. That's a great exercise to learn more about blockchain development. The last thing I wanna show here is that the contract service artificially waits a certain number of milliseconds. I believe I have it set to around 5,000, which gives you a five second wait. When we play the game, each time you do a signed transaction, you'll see it say waiting for a transaction and it waits about five seconds. From trial and error, I realize that amount of time is enough that the blockchain reflects the new value. So if I set gold to 10, I wait those seconds, then next time I call get gold, I can count on it being available. It's not immediately available due to the way that blockchains function. Let's take a look at the game now. Let's go ahead and run in contract mode now. Here we have the game running. Let's authenticate. And let's sign. Now we've authenticated so we can view the collection. We have nothing in our collection yet. We can check out the settings. Settings lets us reset all the data and go back to a starting point. It's good for debugging. We could also log out, but let's go ahead and start the game. We can play the game betting 10 gold, 30 gold, or 150 gold. Because we've only got 100 gold at the moment, we have two options. I'll play for 30 gold. Here we spent 30 and we've won 100 gold back. Now we can view our collection and we see that we have won one prize that's worth two gold. In a future version of this game, you could sell the items. We haven't implemented that yet, but you can imagine being able to select an item and then click a sell button and earn back some or all of the gold of the original price, depending how the game is organized. Next, let's look at the Gaming Metaverse Hackathon. Join the Morales Kronos Web3 Gaming Hackathon. Compete for a total prize pool of $100,000. Morales provides a single workflow for creating high performance dApps. Kronos is the first ever EVM compatible chain built on Cosmos. Register today and build on Kronos with Morales. Let's recap what we've learned today. The Web3 Magic Treasure Chest game uses Unity, Morales, and Kronos. It's now a complete game. Morales provides a single workflow for creating high performance dApps. Kronos is the first ever EVM compatible chain that's built on top of Cosmos. With Morales and Kronos, what will you build next? Visit docs.morales.io to download and get started. Thanks.